There's nothing like League. And this is the Betfred Super League. Welcome along, everyone, to this week's edition of Eddie and Steve-O, the podcast. Thanks, as always, for the support we get from the game's major sponsors, Betfred. Well, what a week it's been since we were last with you, and Steve-O, nowhere else to start other than Warrington, where the 18-month reign of Daryl Powell's coach came to an end after the miserable 42-6 defeat at bottom of the table, Wakefield. It's a result that puts the cat amongst the pigeons in West Yorkshire, more about that later. But as far as Daryl Powell and Warrington are concerned, well, Daryl lasted exactly 50 games in charge and the aim came on Sunday night after a blistering attack from him in his post-match press conference on the culture and the players at the club. It feels to me, Stavo, like death from a thousand cuts, but the agony at least is now over. The axe was definitely going to fall and I'm sure that Daryl Powell was fully aware of that. Uh, publicly to virtually say that uh, perhaps not trying enough uh, was enough for the club to say, well, that's it. Um, I'm sure that Daryl Powell knew exactly what he was doing. I think he wanted a way. Um, talking about the way that the club has been run, etc. and so forth, was definitely the last dagger in the back wasn't it yes and Chairman Stuart Middleton he says results and performances over the past 18 months which is right the way from the start of Darrell's reign have fallen short of standards we expect and we feel the club needs to move in a new direction so you know 8 from 8 at the start of the year but things went wrong after the defeats to St Helens and Wigan and now they're clinging on to a top six spot well I reckon I reckon he, he lost the team itself or maybe the team wanted to lose the coach Darrell Powell you know a few weeks back um, it was reported that St Helens had, had bought Darrell Clark now to me Darrell Clark owes quite a lot to Darrell Powell he virtually steered him through into shall we say the top grade whilst at Castleford and is still a damn fine player otherwise St Helens wouldn't have gone in for him but I just raised my eyebrows and I'm thinking why on earth would Darrell Powell who at that time was a coach at Warrington um, not do a deal to match what St Helens gave them so as I said raised my eyebrows and uh, it came to the see you later alligator Yes, after his eighth defeat in nine matches, his sixth defeat in a row. Um, he spent eight years at Castleford previously. He came to Warrington last year. Um, there was obviously a clear out needed. He sort of said that at the start. He said, you know, we've got to change the culture. We've got to change a lot of things. Um, 50 games on, uh, eight wins from eight at the start of the year, as I say. It all has gone sadly, sadly wrong. And the club finishing 11th, their worst ever year in Super League in 2022. That didn't help, that's for sure. Yeah, they expected so much because he'd done such a fine job at Castleford, as we all know. Um, and he's rated highly, that is for sure. I'm sure that uh, some other club will be keen to sort of talk to him. But of course, uh, down under... They're all speculating that maybe uh, Paul Rowley will be approached. There's even talk about Justin Holbrook, who, I must say, uh, 
is a man that everybody seems to be targeting. There's talk about West Tigers talking to Holbrook, the Newcastle Knights, their coach O'Brien has got one year to go and he, in a, on his contract. He should be the coach for 2024. But again, they've made it quite clear as the Knights that they've actually spoken to Justin Holbrook. So amazingly, Holbrook is right there. Is he coming back to the UK or is he going to stay in Australia? Well, I think he said, hasn't he, that he'd prefer to stay in the NRL. But having said that, he is six to four favourite with Beth Fred to get the Warrington job. Well, it's difficult to to understand, but um, I'm sure that he would be getting a bigger wage in the NRL than perhaps what Warrington could offer him. But one never knows. I mean, he, he was quite successful at St. Helens. Uh, is a damn fine coach. Uh, it was a bit of a surprise when uh, it got sacked uh, from the Queensland side. And in many ways, you, you sort of think to yourself, does that mean that we are not bringing through young coaches in the UK? That once again, we have to go to Australia to get a, a top coach? It makes you scratch your head. It really does. Um the other man who is being mentioned is Anthony Griffin, the former St. George Illawarra Dragons coach. He's a two-to-one. Justin Morgan apparently has thrown his hat into the ring. Steve, oh, what about Lee Breers? Ten-to-one, they're making him in Betfred, uh, forging a career for himself in Brisbane. Do you think Lee might be tempted to come home? Well, I think when you're born and bred in the UK, um, depends on family situations. But from all, all I hear is the fact that he loves being working up in Brisbane, and why not? It's uh, great weather. It's very, very rare it gets cold up in, in Brisbane. He's doing a fine job. And the Broncos are really pushing. They've got a good chance of actually lifting the trophy. They are playing outstanding rugby league football, mainly due to the fact that they've got a young pack of forwards who are not only good in attack, they've got great defence. It's very rare that you break down, down the middle against the Brisbane Broncos. So it would surprise me because it is learning, Breers is learning as much as he can down there and they rate him, otherwise they wouldn't have wanted him in the first place, but uh, he's doing a great job with organising the three-quarter line, especially the two halfbacks. He's doing a great job. And why would you not want to go to the beach and get the sunshine? <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, that, that doesn't surprise me that he's doing a great job in, in Brisbane because I, I believe Lee did a great job with uh, Harry Smith, for instance, at Wigan. Turned him into a, a great tactician and, what's more, a very, very good kicker of the football as well. Uh, here's some other names that have come up. Uh, Brett Hodgson, uh, Tony Smith, for goodness sake, Stephen Price to go back, Sean Wayne, 16 to 1, Ian Watson from Huddersfield, 33 to 1. He's turning the Giants around at the moment. And even Kevin Brown gets a mention, Steve O, at 100 to 1. <laughs> uh, I think your uh, well, name is well, around about 1,000 to 1, but uh, you know, I'd, I'd put a pound on you. I'd have a go at you. Yeah, well, keep keep that keep your money in your wallet, Eddie. <laughs> that's that's if you still got one. Uh, I, I, no money I, I never no saw it. I never saw it. Don't worry, don't worry. Well, Listen, in the meantime, it, 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 it's all speculation, Eddie. But once again, uh, at the top of the tree, you normally find it's an Australian that they're going to go for. And as I said, as I said earlier, are we not developing? the coaches in the UK and again it comes down to that awful word money if you've got plenty of money if you've got a great backer at the club then you're on your way to success whether you like it or not it all comes down shillings and pence and pounds you're right but you know Warrington have um, good backers they do they have money behind them and at the moment the job is in an interim uh, basis for Gary Chambers and 
Richard Marshall. They're in charge for the visit of Catalan Dragons this Friday night. I mean, talk about the Poison Chalice. After that, they've got Leeds and Hull both away. By the time a new man turns up, unless Gary and Richard can wave a magic wand, Warrington might be well and truly out of the picture. There's only seven weekly rounds left, three more if you get to the grand final. I just wonder if they will hang on. I wonder if they'll hang on till the end of the season and not rush into an appointment. Well, it's going to be difficult for them, but it's an amazing coincidence that when something like you lose the coach, um, it's how the players get together themselves and say, look, uh, we've lost the coach. Were we the reason for doing that? One never knows. But I think in this occasion, I think perhaps the, the players will be quite happy that they've lost their coach. And so many times in the past, over many, many years, they bond together and put in an absolute wonderful performance. And I think you'll find that this weekend. Uh, Well, we'll wait and see. And in all this talk about Daryl Powell, we shouldn't forget that Wakefield, well, they've beaten Warrington. That's their fourth win. They're now level on points at the foot of the table with the Castleford Tigers, who they meet at Bellevue in three weeks' time. It's only points difference that's keeping Wakefield at the bottom, and I think that's 12 or 14 points difference as far as that's concerned. So suddenly Wakefield are looking up and Castleford are looking down. Yeah, and and once again, uh, both coaches. Look, Applegarth has done an amazing job. Uh, He he, he scoured the world, hasn't he, to try to get players who, who he felt were confident to get it back into it. And I mean... For them to beat Warrington with such, well, I mean, it, it was just something that you can't, you can't believe that Warrington could go down by so many points. If it was just a couple of points, maybe you could say, well, at least they, you know they really give it a good shot. But uh, they didn't. They were completely broken apart by a Wakefield side that have got so much positivity inside them now and Castleford they're they're trying to do exactly the same thing I mean how many players are are they throwing up oh we're trying to get so and so we're trying to get so and so Uh, and we keep saying it but this could be the last time promotion and relegation comes into our game in the UK so that's how desperate it is yeah, as I said earlier, the cat is very much uh, amongst the pigeons in both Castleford and Wakefield. I mean, Hulkingston Rovers' victory over Castleford, it was a massive win and showing no sign of weariness after their cup exploits against the Wigan Warriors. The, Hull KR staying on course for a top six finish with this big win over Castleford. Willie Peters, he's doing a magnificent job. No wonder well, no wonder Steve O'Clubs look to Australia when you bring someone like Peters across and look at the... Uh, Look at the effect he's had on Hull KR this year. It just shows you that the development of coaches down under is far more impressive than what we've got in the UK. And that's why they keep going to Australia. Yes, I take your point. But the the two English coaches um, who are really making headlines this year, Matty Pete at Wigan and Paul Wellens at Saints, they both bounced back from their cup semi-final heartbreaks Saints too good for Leeds. Jack Wells be the star of the show. Two tries and a hand and a couple of others. Third game between those two, Leeds and Saints this year. They've been really tight affairs. Golden point wins in the previous two. Only four points in it this time. I mean, a tremendous game and the end of a very emotional week for St. Helens, wasn't it? Yeah, it it, it was. And uh, it it just gives you the the impression that they, they have the ability to bounce back. And why not? They've won so many trophies. Um, And don't count them out. Though I have to give a lot of credit to the Catalan side. Uh, The only problem is, out of the the last six games, Eddie, um, they only have two games at home. And it is a great advantage for the French side to be playing at home. Can they still hold the top position with only two home games remaining? And they play Warrington this weekend. And I can assure you, uh, as we said earlier, I think Warrington will bounce back. 
I think they do not want, the players do not want to be embarrassed. And they will be fighting, not just fighting to get the two points, Eddie, but fighting perhaps to keep their contracts. Yeah, well, whoever comes in has got uh, some very, very big decisions to make at Warrington. But you're right, Catalan look the real deal right now. They're four points clear at the top. So if one or two of those away games go against them, they have got some points to play with. You know, next season though, Steve, oh, Tompkins is retiring the end of this year, and I understand up to five players are on their way out of the door to pastures new from the Catalan Dragons. So a rebuilding job is on the way. You get the feeling for Steve McNamara and Catalan, it's now or never, don't you? Uh, yes. And uh, look, Steve McNamara is a fine coach, but the one thing about Steve is that he he understands that junior development is important. I'm sure that McNamara has got some plan in place now for bringing these youngsters through. I know they're going to lose quite a lot of experienced players for next season, but keep your eye on them. You'll find a few new names come through. Yes, and they've also got Tom Johnston, of course, who's in fine scoring form again, former Wakefield man. He's now leading the try-scoring charts in Super League this season with 24 tries after his uh, couple at the weekend against Salford. I mean, Salford, they're slipping down, aren't they? They're like ice melting in the heat. Um, injuries have depleted them. But also, King uh, Vunyawa, he was turned away at the airport, apparently, because of a visa problem. I mean, what on earth is going on? They only had 18 players to choose from for the game. I mean, you, you surely must know, before you get on the plane to Perpignan, if you're going to get into France with your visa, you must know that, surely. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's not the first time that this has occurred, Eddie. Uh, quite a few players have arrived there, um, especially the ones uh, from Australia, because they have a different situation. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, the Australian government and the French government had a real old ding-dong battle um, over the sea waters and, and uh, the, the, the ships coming into Australian waters. Um, so it's one of the places in Europe whereby um, if you're a foreign player that you have to have a separate visa whereas in England an English player can, can just get through with his passport but you're right um, why on earth should a club not realise like I've realised you've realised that you need a visa it's quite simple, but sometimes the simple things in life, Eddie, like you and I, we forget. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We do. You're right. Um, I mentioned Ian Watson being in the frame, according to the bookies anyway, for the Warrington game. Uh, his Huddersfield team have really turned things around. They've won three in a row now, pulling themselves away from the relegation zone. They're looking upwards rather than downwards and a possible, and I must say unlikely, top six finish. But they beat Hull on Thursday night for a third win in a row. They're only six points off the playoff places now and a game in hand against St. Helens on August the 13th, the day after Wembley. Do you think Ian Watson can turn them in to what we all thought they would be at the start of this season, and that is a playoff place team? Yeah, I think they they sort of left everybody sort of scratching their head because um, they were expected to be fighting for a playoff situation. Um, but to beat Hull, 1912, uh, as you say, three wins on the trot, that builds the confidence. He's a fine coach. Uh, I've always admired his attitude and the way that it, he, he, brings, he brings youngsters through as well in, in, into the side. Um, it's going to be difficult for them to do that, Eddie. But, you know, the Giants will, will fight their way. They could make it, but I wouldn't have a shilling on them. No, it's a long shot. There's no doubt about that. I mentioned Saints bouncing back uh, from the Cup semi-final after that emotional week. And it was emotional, Steve, over for St. Helens for one thing. Their coach, Paul Wellens, was fiercely critical of the governing body following tackles by John Asiata of Lee in the semi-final that left four of his men, four of his men, injured. Alex Wormsley and Ignatius Parsi are out for the remainder of the season. He says that Asiata's tackling style is dangerous and reckless and should be outlawed. The tackles didn't look good. What do you think? Well, according to the laws of the game, we don't have rules in our game, the laws, 
Um, but it, it sometimes takes something as tragic as this to make the Rugby Football League realise, Super League, that something has to change. Ironically, um, De Bellin, the St. George second rower, has just received a, a four-match ban for virtually doing a similar tackle. So down in, in Australia, they've already got it set up that you know if it's a dangerous hip drop tackle, then you will be suspended. And De Bellin has picked up a four-match ban. So they've got it organised down here. And I think Paul Wellens is spot on. I, I don't think it's a case of sour grapes. But same player, four players, something's got to be done. Yeah, it's universally agreed that the tackles aren't lawful, as you rightly say, as it stands at the moment. Maybe it will be looked at uh, this coming close season. Let's wait and see. I mean, they weren't only dangerous to the four players involved from St. Helens. They were really dangerous for John Asiata. I mean, the way he flew in, blimey, he could have been, he could have been seriously injured himself. Yeah, but as I say, um, that's why it takes something like this and uh, fair play uh, to Wellens for him to highlight it and come out strongly. You know, he could have sent just a letter and, and to the uh, to the Super League saying that look into this. He came out publicly, and when you do that, then they've got to take notice. And I'm sure, as I've just mentioned, if they ban people down under, then they should ban people up in the UK. Well, Asiata and Lee certainly didn't look themselves in the game at Wigan on Saturday. Uh, just as in the first meeting, Lee established a 6-0 lead, but then they fell away. They were beaten 48 points to 18. Lee had lost just one of 14 coming into that game. They're at Wembley, of course. Maybe they had a little bit of a hangover after the celebrations for getting there for the first time in 50-odd years. It, it happens quite a lot that when you've got the euphoria of going to Wembley, mentally it's difficult to get yourself back up on the horse. And it didn't surprise me. 44-18 is a, a pretty good whacking. Wigan back in, into the swinging of things. But um, in the back of the mind, and it will affect the league players, whether they like it or not, will I get injured before I have the chance to walk out at Wembley? Look, it's, it's every player's dream. And it's difficult for them to sort of collectively get together and say, look, We've got to still put in that 100% effort that's got us so high in the table. But it's difficult when you when these players will be thinking, I want to play at Wembley. We have a chance of winning a, a, a Challenge Cup winner's medal. Uh, and it's difficult to overcome, Eddie. How many times have we seen it? Uh, after the semi-final or the week before the final, they put out a reserve team because they're frightened to death that they'll lose their star players, etc., etc. You can't blame them. It's difficult for the players to push it to one, one, one side. It's not easy. Um, Hull Kingston Rovers, by the way, uh, this might come as a surprise, they've signed Cesar Rouget from Catalan, Isaac Shaw from Wakefield, and Luke Thomas from Warrington. Listen to this on two-week loan deals, and all three are expected to play at Wigan on Friday night. There'll be wholesale changes to the side as Rovers look uh, to rest their key men for Wembley against Lee. And Hull Kingston Rovers, you can get 6-1 to one on them to beat Wigan. Wigan, by the way, uh, the 10-1 to one on. So, so the bookies have made their mind up. Wigan are going to win that one. And uh, Hull KR are probably going to take a fresh squad to Wembley the following week. It, it always happens, you're right. It always happens that they, they rest players before the big showpiece. Yeah, you, look, you can't blame them. Um, and it, it's difficult to overcome. But when you start borrowing players, that just gives you some indication that um, Wembley is so important for a rugby league player. It is. And, and very important to a rugby league club as well because Lee might be on the crest of a wave with Wembley just a... Uh, just over 10 days or so away, but uh, their owner, Derek Beaumont, is taking very seriously an incident 
after the semi-final at Warrington when a flare was set off in the crowd and a fan was injured with burns to their body. Uh, Derek has asked his supporters to identify the culprit and he'll then take appropriate action. He's also um, really annoyed about spectators running onto the field after the final siren. He warns that any future similar behaviour will be punished. He says he takes this very seriously. The reputation of the club and he, uh, he will eradicate any poor behaviour that jeopardises that reputation. A, a, a warning shot and a timely warning shot I think as well with Wembley looming. He doesn't want to go to Wembley and the uh, the occasion be be ruined for him. Well it's spot on. Um, look for years and years and years everyone in, in our game has respected uh, the officials all right we have the odd, odd occasion when an official might be confronted but generally speaking uh, a rugby league fan has got his head on and realizes that you know don't copy these idiots that we have in Europe with the football I mean you see some of the games and there's flares going up uh, it doesn't surprise me we never hear of anybody being injured with a, with a flare, but they're damn dangerous. I'm glad that Bowman has said, right, he'll be banned for life, and so he should. Little postscript to the Lee story. Um, Oliver Gildart, I'm told, has joined Lee on loan uh, for the rest of the season. Now, of course, Lee play Hulkingston Rovers at Wembley, but I don't think... And, and Gildart, by the way, is going to Hulkingston Rovers next year on a permanent deal he can't play at Wembley though can he against Hull KR the, I think July the 14th is the Challenge Cup deadline for signings the Super League signing uh, deadline is August the 4th but wouldn't it be interesting if Oliver Gildart pulled on a Lee shirt and took on his former employers at Wembley he, before he gets to Rovers for the, the beginning of next season I don't think it's going to happen because it's, it's against the rules but you see where I'm coming from yeah, it is against the laws of the game, Eddie. Um, but um, Gildart has struggled uh, to make a real big name for himself down down under. And I, I think he's come to realisation that he's still got a lot to offer. He's a damn fine player. He's strong, he's tough. And uh, I think it's going to be a good acquisition for Lee. Yeah, it'll probably help them towards the end of the season. And if they get in... Well, it looks like they're going to get into the playoffs. If they get within a sniff of uh, Old Trafford. Uh, Oliver Gildart might be going back there again, but this time in the Lee colours. Um, Blake Austin, steve at Leeds, his future is still to be decided. Here's one that's come out of left field. Featherstone Rovers want him. The Rovers are 10 points clear at the top of the championship table. It's a statement of Rovers' intent, isn't it, if they get him? I mean, they've still got to get through an inter-Super League via the playoff system but they are far and away the best team in the championship and they want Blake Austin if they get there. Well, he's a good player, solid player, that's for sure. And uh, he's got the experience and obviously Featherston, they realise they, they must be odds on to, to be promoted and they are a club that <laughs> also realises that, um, as we mentioned earlier, promotion and relegation will be scrapped at the end of it. And... I think you'll find that Featherstone will be looking towards getting a few more experienced players as long as they can get the money to entice them across to Featherstone. And that's not easy. They won't come for next to nothing. And there is a prospect. Well, there isn't a prospect because it's either Castleford or Wakefield that's going down. But in another year, there could have been a prospect of Featherstone, Castleford, and Wakefield, what what do you say? You, you couldn't throw a satellite dish over the two towns. You'd, you'd cover them. Um, they could have all have been playing in Super League one of these uh, one of these days, couldn't they? But uh, Featherston this year, as you say, they look they look odds on. Uh, it'll be fascinating to see if they get there. They've got to get through the playoffs, though, as I've said. Yeah, well, they're favourites for it, and uh, they've every right to be favourites. They've played some some good rugby rugby league this year. Um, they've been, shall we say fine ambassadors and it'll be good for that area well look that's just about the Super League scene all wrapped up uh, and you've got a plane to catch I understand by the way yes I'll be coming back to the UK in the next few weeks and uh, looking forward to it down under bit of a sad news as well the great Wally Lewis has, uh, has revealed that uh, he's suffering from brain damage 
Uh, it's a type of dementia. They call it chronic trauma. It's sad to hear that uh, uh, it, it, the, the great Waller Lewis, I mean, he was one of the greatest Australian rugby league players that uh, has ever pulled on a pair of boots. Um, and it, it's just sad. And it, it, do, it joins a, a long list of so many players, not just in in uh, Australia, but quite a few in the UK as well. It's a, it's a disturbing sort of situation. And it's uh, it's something that uh, I am aware of, um, and it's something that we've got to seriously look at. Very much so. Uh, and just before we go, um, John Davis, the great John Davis, Steve-O, TV producer extraordinaire. He was our original executive producer at uh, BSB, remember those days, and Champion Television. He gave you that job all those years ago. Well, sadly, John has uh, passed away. I want to pay tribute to John Davis, Steve-O. He's, he's not got a mention anywhere, as far as I'm aware. Uh, what a great man. And if it wasn't for John, Steve-O, you and I would not be doing what we're doing here today. Yeah, sad news indeed. He was uh, a, a wonderful gentleman, and uh, I refer to the gentle side of him, a great a great man in regards to television so both of us owe a great deal to a wonderful person and rest in peace my friend yeah sad news indeed about dear old john and uh you know our deepest sympathy goes to his uh, his family he was a wonderful man and without him steve-o we wouldn't be where we are today no question about that whatsoever look let's not end on a, a desperately sad note like that you, you must have something to cheer us up from the NRL mustn't you well uh, I'm not so sure about cheering you up Eddie because um, <laughs> the, the Penrith Panthers who, who are looking well amazing uh, I, I just cannot see any team down under going to stop them by winning the premiership yet again they beat Cronulla Sharks 28-0 but Cronulla lose forward Cameron McInnes broke the NRL record for tackles. He had an amazing 81 tackles during wow. the game. They interviewed him after the game. He looked like he'd done 10 rounds with Cassius Clay. Absolutely exhausted. And uh, he was sat down. He could, he could hardly speak. And I'm not surprised after 81 tackles. The other amazing piece of news, Eddie, is that According to the NRL, they've made it quite clear that the kickoff for the 2024 season in the NRL next year will start in Las Vegas. What? Now, that in Las Vegas, they're going to call it the Australian Week in Vegas. Uh, there's talk about the Aussie actor, Hugh Jackman, being an ambassador. Uh, they've approached the U2 band to be involved. And they're going to make it a spectacular Australia week in Las Vegas. And they've already suggested that Brisbane and Manly will be two of the teams that will kick off the season, uh, especially Manly, because their owner, Scott Penn, actually lives in New York. So there is a huge push to not just attract more fans down under, but to try to break into a lucrative market in the USA. Tremendous fantastic. news for our game of rugby league. Absolutely fantastic. And all I can say after that, Steve-O, is cue the song. Viva Las Vegas. Off you go. Give us a, give us a quick rendition. Oh, dear me. <laughs> I take that as a no, then. Talk to you next week. Bye, top man. <laughs>